Hi, everybody. I'm Suzanne Shanahan here at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke, and I'm delighted to welcome you to week five of Reimagining the World Together, How Friendship Matters for Our Future. For those of you who haven't joined us before, this series brings together sets of friends and colleagues, often unlikely duos, to share how their relationship has shaped their lives, their work, and their commitments in the world. Reimagining the World Together uh, is a project and part of the Purpose Project here at Duke, a Duke Endowment funded program in collaboration with Duke Divinity, the Keenan Institute and the, undergraduate, the Office of Undergraduate Education. Uh, this project seeks to make cultivating character, explorations of purpose and meaning a central part of the Duke experience. Uh, many of the conversations are often an intimate glimpse into the nature of relationships. I've often felt like I was in the kitchen listening to a conversation happening on the couch just a few feet away. There's been laughing, there's been crying, there's been singing. Uh, but each conversation gives us a very interesting and in-depth sense of a relationship between two or more people and how that's shaped their work in the world. Today, we are delighted to have a conversation led by beloved professor of cultural anthropology, a sports enthusiast and writer, Oren Starn, together uh, with two more Duke grads, this time Shane Battier and Ravi Gupta, who while they actually overlapped a bit here at Duke, uh, became friends sometime later. Shane Battier is a former Duke and NBA player he was known as one of the top, the league's top individual and perimeter defenders. Shane is known as a smart player that makes his teammates better. He's a multiplier. Shane was also known by his analytics knowledge as a player, and he helped the Miami Heat win uh, two consecutive championships in 2012 and 2013. He is now vice president of basketball development and analytics with the Miami Heat. Shane and his wife, Heidi, have established the Battier Take Charge Foundation, dedicated to providing resources uh, for the development and education of underserved youth and teens. Ravi is currently a partner at Sequoia Capital, where he focuses on consumer, mobile internet, and fintech investments. Ravi's passion really lies in investing in and helping visionaries turn their dreams into a reality. He has a strong work ethic, strong sense of humility, and that makes him an invaluable partner. Ravi believes that being a parent has really shaped uh, the person he is today. It's also clarified a lot of his decision making, including around work. He has, said, uh, he has been said to ask yourself, how important is this? Will, will this be in a year or two? Instead of how important will this be tomorrow? Ravi says it teaches you to delineate between the standard ups and downs and the true crucible moments. Before I turn the conversation over to Oren, a brief note about logistics. So first, in this new Zoom reality, there are often technical troubles. Uh, please rest assured, there are a number of folks behind the scenes who will swiftly jump in and address any issues. Second, um, I I imagine there'll be lots and lots of interest in conversation and asking of questions. Please submit those via the chat, via the Q&A mechanism, and they will be forwarded directly to Oren to ask at about 6.05. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Oren uh, for what promises to be a great conversation. Thanks all. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And it's a treat to be part of this conversation and to be here with these two super distinguished Duke alums, one a legend of the basketball world and the other a legend of the investing world. And I'll start off by asking Ravi how he got to be friends with Shane. Uh, it's great to meet everyone and thank you for having me. Um, I got to meet Shane, I, you know, I entered a sweepstakes, as you know, he's very famous. And so I sent him an email and I was the lucky 500th recipient. Uh, <laughs> no, um, Shane and I, we share a lot of mutual friends. And we were at a wedding actually together for one of those mutual friends. And we just kind of hit it off. We started chatting and we got to know each other. And then I think that this is something that we'll talk about more, but I think we both decided to like invest in the relationship uh, and get to know each other and um, build on that shared foundation. But 
uh, that was probably five, seven years ago. So not, this is not a 20 year friendship, even though it feels like one. Do you have the same version of events, Shane, or, or do you have a different story about this? Yeah, my, my <laughs> version is probably a little fuzzier because I remember uh, uh, copious amounts of wine were being sampled in the hills of Santa Barbara. And so, you know, I, I don't know if it was the Cabernet that day uh, in the hills of Santa Barbara, but, uh, you know, in, in life, you, you go through and, and every now and then you, you meet somebody and there's just something about, you know, that person or, or that couple. And you say, you know what, that, that, you know, in this case, uh, Avni's wife is, is probably uh, more impressive than, than Ravi. Uh, but, but looking at the Guptas to say, you know what, they, they get it, they get it. And um, I want to get to know them better. Or um, Ravi, were you, what's your, um, what's your history of friendship? Were you a kid who had a ton of friends or were you like an outsider, loner, loser like me? Or, and then how has your attitude towards friendship changed as you've, as you've grown? I mean, some people say it's harder to make good friends as you get older. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, but give, me the, give me the short history of your history of friendship. Yeah, um, so my parents are from India. Um, and I think if you, I think what I observed when I was growing up was that some friends could basically turn into family, right? Because that shared experience that those folks had along with my parents those are people that we relied on, you know, and I saw around and these were relationships built over a long time. And so friendship was always really important to me. So I was lucky enough to have some very close friends growing up. And I, um, it's always been something that's mattered a lot. I think to your point on the sort of difficulty of making good friends after a certain age, I read an article some number of years back, which said it's the title was why it's hard to make good friends after 30. And I read it and it was actually a pretty fascinating article, which was basically it said friendship is a product of frequency and vulnerability. And mm -hmm. after a certain age, you stop seeing people as frequently, right? And you basically cease to be vulnerable with them. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're in college, for instance, you'll see people all the time and you see them in these vulnerable moments where you have a bad test, you break up with a you know, uh, partner or whatever. And those friendships really stick. And you know, it's sad because you don't allow yourself to be vulnerable after a certain point. So I think you have to really actively fight against that if you're gonna try and build real relationships. Mm -hmm. What about you, Shane? Um, you know, I, I had an interesting situation growing up. Um, I grew up uh, as part of a mixed household. My, my dad's black, my mom's white um, in a middle upper class part of Detroit, Birmingham, Michigan. And obviously I, I was the tallest kid of my, in my grade, uh, I look. I was a kid. I always had to carry the birth certificate to the to the football game to prove I was I was really eight when I looked like I was twelve years old. Um, you know, the fact that I was mixed, there was no one like me in my school. Uh, I had no friends who had black parents or were mixed like me. Um, you know, even in the middle class, upper class part of my my town, um, uh, my family didn't have much. We had enough, but but not as much as my other friends. And so um, I really looked at sports as a refuge for me. And I realized, you know, really in kindergarten that when I helped my friends win at recess on the kickball field, on the basketball court, on the sand lot, on the, on the football field, people love me and they want me around. So it doesn't, didn't really matter what I did as long as, as we won. And so that was really the basis of all my friendships uh, really to today is, hey, let's let's do something great together mm -hmm. and if, if we do something great together uh we all enjoy it and we all go uptown on, on, on the same boat and uh and, and so um you know obviously being a professional athlete and and garnering the, the attention and, and the wealth that i did early on uh it, it, it jades you a little bit it makes you much more uh guarded uh, when it comes to other people, you know, 23, I was, I was a millionaire after growing up with, with nothing. And you can imagine the psychological strand that goes along with that. But uh, you learn really quickly to, uh, to, to, to look at people's heart motives. And I, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character where I can, I can figure out someone mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, but that's, that was out of necessity. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, this goes back to something you said, I think uh, a bit earlier, Shane, but 
it feels to me like as you get older that when you make new friends, it's, it's a little more purposeful than when you're young. You mentioned, Shane, meeting Robbie and thinking to yourself that this was a person that you wanted to be friends with. When we're younger, it seems like we, you know, we kind of fall in, we fall in and out of friendships easily. And, you know, you know you're know, you friends with a, bit, with a kid down the block, best friends for a couple of weeks and you have a fight and people move in and out of your life. Some of us keep these childhood friends, but in a way, does there feel like something powerful, meaningful about the fact that, you know, both of you are super successful people and lots of people would like to be your friends, but you, but you make these kinds of choices and that invests a kind of meaning and pleasure in the relationship? You know, Robbie, that's a great question. I think there's two forces at work here. I think as we get older, we, we understand mortality better and we understand the, the expenditure of time is, is our most valuable expenditure that we have. And we, we, that shapes how we, how we look at the world. And at least for me, you know, it's made me value uh, the relationships I develop and the, and the time I spend to develop those relationships. Um, if I don't feel it's worth it, I'm not going to spend my time and you'll know right away. <laughs> and it's hard, but life is short. We got to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe Robbie, I, I, I could ask you this, but it's really a question for both of you. you know, sometimes when we make friends with people who are in the same business as us, who work at the office or not, um, there's also, it seems like a kind of pleasure and beauty and a kind of learning experience that goes along with becoming friends with somebody who's not doing what you do because it opens up whole new worlds to you and you guys have a kind of overlap in the sense that sports is a business and investing is a kind of a sport so i'm sure they're kind of things that you have in common but is that part of the pleasure of friendship with shane or with other friends of, of trying to make friends who, who who can show you something different open up kind of different worlds to you yeah i mean my favorite book is How Will You Measure Your Life by Clay Christensen. And, you know, he talks a lot about that, which is that one mistake that people who strive to be successful can make is thinking their life is all about one thing, right? It's all about work. And so it is interesting to talk to people who are in the same business as you because there's shared experience and you can talk. But you run the risk of being a pretty boring person all of a sudden because you don't learn anything outside of what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Shane and I have a ton in common when you think about things that matter, right? We're both parents, we're both husbands, right? We both are, you know, uh, sons, we, and we're both good friends to people. And we both went to the same school. We think about, you know, a lot of those things where like, that's actually a lot of what we talk about. And then also on the professional side, I find that it's more helpful sometimes to talk to somebody who's outside of it. Before I worked in my current job, you know, Shane will laugh, but before I worked in my current job, I worked at Instacart, the grocery delivery company. And we had like this moment of, of real crisis for work where, you know, Amazon bought Whole Foods and it was this big moment of like, well, wait a second, what are we gonna do? Well, if I talked to anyone in the industry, they sort of had one answer, but I just, you know, Shane and I were building our friendship and I was like, listen, like I'm supposed to be a leader of this company. I'm, and honestly, I'm not really sure what to do right now. And Shane brought it back to some of his experiences of going through adversity and the leadership he'd done as well as the leadership he'd observed. And those stories actually were more helpful to me than anything else because you learned by analogy. And so I would say, I think if you think of yourself as a person with kind of more than one interest, right? You can really find the joy in people that are different than you. And I, look, I also think to be fair, I, I really look up to Shane. You know, I, I think it's fun to have friends who you admire and respect and are proud to tell people that you're friends with them. I really love one of my favorite things is being friends with people like Shane and there's not very many. Um, and so, but the last thing I'd say, and this is so interesting, Shane talks about time. I totally agree with that. But what's so interesting is that Shane has all the time in the world for people that he cares about. So he talks about busy and that's the least amount of, that's the thing that you have the least of. But Shane, if I text him at any point, he'll jump on the phone right then. The first time we hung out for a long time, Shane just came to my house and spent the whole day with us. And like my, he was spending time with my three-year-old son who wanted to show him his room. And so the nice thing is if you pick the things you spend time on, you can actually go pretty deep, you know, uh, if you're much more purposeful. So that's something I've learned from him that I try to emulate. How about for both of you in the, in our, the, in the time of the pandemic, how, how your relationship to friendships and to your 
both to your past and your present has changed. One of the things that I found, because I have more time in front of my computer and my rhythms are scrambled like they are for everybody in one way or another, is that I've been thinking and kind of reconnecting or kind of sending messages or whatever to people I've gotten out of touch with, or it's sort of like putting me into this kind of memory palace of sort of reconnecting and thinking about things in a way that I sometimes don't in the kind of relentless rhythms of everyday life. Both of you guys are super more important and busy than I am, so maybe you don't have time for all of this, you know, reminiscing about the past in this moment. But I'm curious if, if, if things, if, if this has made you think in new ways about past friendships and past people oh, or not. I would say, ironically, when um, I was invited by Sanyin um, to be part of the series, Ravi was the first person I, I thought of that I could, we, we have to basically extend what we do every two weeks now in front of the world. And, you know, ever since the pandemic started, we, we have a standing reservation along with Mike Dunleavy, who was a close friend of ours and an absolute knucklehead, um, just to connect and, and connect, um, uh, you know, about being a dad, about being a father. Mm -hmm. um, look, it's hard for everyone. Uh, it's, the pandemic is hard for everyone. It, it's, it's hard for grown men to show their emotions and, and be vulnerable. It's hard, you know, and especially for, for Mike and I, who, who grew up in, in a locker room where we we're taught from an early age, cover up your weaknesses. You know, any vulnerability that you show will be, will be attacked. And, you, and someone will, will take the dream that you have because of your vulnerability and your weakness. So guess what you, you, you teach yourself to do? You put up walls, okay? And you don't let anyone in, okay? And you talk about making friends, this tough because no one can get in and you don't really venture out of those walls. Mm. Uh, and that's a lesson that I had to learn to, to really deconstruct when I retired. I really mm -hmm. struggled in retirement and uh, to be vulnerable with other men. Uh, I didn't have a problem being vulnerable with my wife or, or, or her circle of friends, uh, but with men. And so when you find somebody, uh, you know, look, we're not, we're, not talking, we're not talking about, you know, duvet covers and, and <laughs> Things, things like that. I love that duvet covers was the topic that you came to know to quite a bit about them, Shane. Yeah, that's the, that's the least <laughs> masculine thing I could think about, duvet covers. <laughs> uh, but it, we wanted to create a forum where we can just talk and there's no judgment and there's, there's immediate feedback and that, that's what makes us better. Mm. And, and you have to be strong to be able to accept that and, and be vulnerable. Um, but it's, it's elevated my game and, okay. and immeasurably. And so that's, that's why I chose, you know, I reached out to Robbie right away as soon as I got the email. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, two great friends in Mike and Robbie to be able to, sh to share those things amongst other friends uh, to share those, those feelings and, and those, have those talks with. Mm -hmm. I wanted to paraphrase a question from Danny Yan from, uh, from the audience. Uh, and the question is, it's not exactly as, um, uh, as she put it, but how much does friendship matter to organizational success? So we had, uh, Danny said it looks to her like the Heat players are friendly and are friends and, and is that part of their success? And I wonder, you know, with you, Ravi, too, whether, you know, do people need to be friends to work well together? I mean, there's certainly in sports, there's plenty of stories of completely dysfunctional teams where people hated each other, or, you know, whatever the 19th, the Yankees of the late 70s, yet, you know, won every game they played. So how do you, you know, is, is, is friendship an, a necessary ingredient to success in business of a sports team or a, or a company? Yeah, I'm happy to start. I'd, I'd actually be interested in, you know, Shane, what he thinks, um, and also obviously what you think. But um, I think, no, I, I guess I don't think so. I think trust and respect are, though. And I think friendship helps it. But I think the thing that's necessary for organizational success is like a shared vision, right, and agreement, an alignment on here's what we're here to do, and here are the values that we're going to use to get us there, right, that are going to guide us. I don't think you have to be going out all the time together in order to get there. But I do think the trust and respect is important. And I do think also what Shane said around the vulnerability is really important. You can't have all the answers, right? You have to be willing to talk to people and say, 
well, what do you think? I don't know how to do this, or I screwed this up. And I think the only way to get anything done that's hard is to have that. So I think it's, to be fair, I think it's sort of a version of friendship, you know? Um, but I think it's more about shared values, shared vision, and trust and respect than it is about maybe some of the things that we typically associate with friendship. Mm -hmm. you, what do you think, Shane? I would agree with Robbie. Um, I, I was taught by a, a coach in my early days, the most important thing when you have, you walk in that locker room is you have the respect, uh, the, the working respect to your teammates. You don't, you don't have to like the guys. Um, you don't have to agree about their lifestyle. You don't have to, you know, be the godparent of your teammates, but you have to have a, a working relationship and a healthy respect. And locker rooms are different because they're awesome because they truly are a melting pot. And as long as you can help us win, I'm cool with you. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what zip code you're born in. I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you're big or slow. Can you help us win? Okay, we're cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, mission focus and, and resiliency are, are really the, the, the main ingredients. I think friendship, where it plays a role in, it's the salt. It's the salt of any, any team. I, th I think it adds, a, it adds a little something that, you know, a little MSG, like you don't know what it is. You know, every year uh, in the locker room, I used to run the March Madness pools. And I used to run the Super Bowl pool. And I used to run this NFL survivor pool. And like, pain in the ass like I didn't like I didn't love doing it but I knew by the reaction of like LeBron James picking a terrible upset and everyone's just like bagging on him like oh LeBron what a terrible pick you know that creates a bond you know and I don't know where that bond may come into play maybe game six in the Eastern Conference Finals against Boston down 3-2 we need to win but all those little minor moments they're like little pieces of glue that just make a team a little better so is friendship essential no but um they make up the little fibers the little msg a little something that often is the difference can i say one thing on top of that which because uh, I, I think this is one of those things where like as i listen to shane's answer i'm like man that was so much better than mine i i, I would take his I, I agree with that like it, it is and and maybe it's something where i guess i'd say like you need to find ways where you have reasons to give someone the benefit of the doubt on your team, right? And you got to find ways where they're not just a robot who's there to, you know, assist you in a task, right? And I think that that goes a long way. And I, I think about some of the things Shane does for our group of friends. You know, Shane is the commissioner, or the commish of our fantasy football league. And I'll tell you, like, I mean, it actually takes a lot of time, right? And there's a lot of thought that goes into it and a lot of, and, but, but it makes you, it makes you so much closer because it's brilliant, right? We have a reason to interact every Sunday, right? All of a sudden there's an ongoing text chain. There's a, there's a connectivity amongst the group that happens and it wouldn't happen if we didn't do it and it wouldn't happen if it wasn't Shane. And so we joke that we always chant four more years, uh, you know, to, to Shane, but he's a very special, you know, leader in that and he finds those things that make it happen. <laughs> We're taking applications. If anyone out there wants to be <laughs> in the Planets Football League, please, please contact me. <laughs> so let's talk about analytics, which seem uh, something that you both have in common. They're, they're crucial to the work that you're doing now, Shane, and they're obviously crucial to what you do, Ravi. Is that something you talk about and learn from like the way that, learn from each other in terms of how you frame things and how you think through a kind of problem. I was struck by one of the things you said in your bio or one of the promotional things, um, Ravi, where you said kind of key question to ask in any situation having to do with business or life is the, is the so what? What, what, what matters here? Because I'm sure, you know, both in business and sports, it's easy to kind of lose track of the, you know, of the, of the forest for the trees. So in thinking about analytics, are there kind of like shared perspectives or things that you help each other with? Or are you kind of, are the, are the kind of analytics in, in business and in investing and in venture capital and in basketball so different that they're really apples and oranges? Go ahead, Shane, do you wanna go or you want me to go? You know, I, I think what I learned from Ravi, um, who I think is one of the most rational people that I know, 
and I think that's why I value his, his friendship um, because he he makes data driven decisions. Obviously, with Sequoia, and that that's his that's his uh, that's his job. He's not going out YOLO, handing out money to every. Uh, uh, you know, every startup in Silicon Valley, he's got to have a very good reason to hand over, uh, you know, the, the bucks that Sequoia does. Um, and so it, it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. If I need to make a decision, um, I better have the best data that I can to, 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 to make the best decision possible, knowing that it's, it's always imperfect. And um, that's, that's a rare mindset, you know, it's, it seems pretty intuitive. Uh, but when you find people who, who truly are process oriented, um, it's good to, to, to see how they think through the process, especially in, in, in their business, but, you know, throughout Robbie's life as well. Do I have it right? You were a religion major at Duke, Shane? I was. I was a religion And major. how, um, so have you become a math guy? And if not, how does your like, study of world religions assist in the development of a um, of a championship yeah. caliber MBA. That's a great question. On, on the normal distribution of uh, folks in the analytics space and sports, I'm probably on, on, the, on the far end in terms of math background. Uh -huh. um, but when I got traded to the Houston Rockets in 2006, the Houston Rockets were the first team to uh, adopt a money ball philosophy for basketball. You know, much like the Moneyball, Oakland A's, Michael Lewis, great book. Uh, Houston Rockets with Daryl Morey and Sam Hinkie were the first to use data as organizational philosophy to, to build their roster, make trades, uh, make draft picks, and, and play the game of basketball. And, and they revolutionized the way basketball got played. And so I learned really, um, you know, from, the, from Yoda and Obi-Wan of uh, basketball analytics, uh, what actually wins basketball games, what data is important, and I learned to look at the game um, in a much different way. Um, the way it explained explain to me is, I, you know, you have to look at black, uh, basketball like you play blackjack, okay? There, there are certain rules uh, that you always follow. When you have 11, you always double down, all right? When you got pocket aces, you always split them. When you got a 17, you always hold. Now, does that ensure victory? No. But does that give you the highest probability of winning that single hand and over the long term, we have, uh, having a winning ROI? Absolutely. And so I became um, versed in probabilistic basketball plays. And so while I never could do the math to, to figure out what that was, I understood what's real, what's not. And so luckily I have a team of, of data scientists and analysts who, who do know how to do the random forest and, and, and all, the, all the good uh, uh, mathematical techniques. Uh, but my skill is I know uh, what passes the smell test and what doesn't in, in data. And, so, and your knowledge of Buddhism and Hindu Sanskrit and Old Testament, that, that hasn't been so useful. Hey, I pray <laughs> to every, every guy out there. Right? <laughs> it's coming handy. And I think it's worked out. So I, I, I do not, uh, I do not, I'm not forlorn about my religion major at all. All right. Yeah, I, I call yeah. on all the gods. <laughs> Most people, yeah, we major in something and we majored in that thing, but it doesn't exactly determine the rest of our life. Um, I'll ask this question to you, Robbie. It's a, it's a, it's a heartfelt and, and kind of vulnerable question in an admirable way um, from an anonymous um, watcher of this. And he or she writes, I just lost my job in tech, ugh, feeling the failure, and immediately re reached out to friends to share. How would you suggest leaning on friends for both reclaiming sense of self, purpose, and getting ready to move on and do the next great thing? Uh, Shane, you're my hero, and Ravi, you must be cool too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty good encompassing of you know uh, Shane and my friendship right there. But well, first, I think it is. It's courageous for the person to say that. So whoever that is, I admire you for being willing to talk about it. I I think maybe a few things. Um, I think that there is massive benefit in sort of shared. Uh, shared experience on this. And I think that most people airbrush what the heck is actually going on in their lives uh, other than to a very small group. And I think that I heard this thing one time, which is that, you know, we compare our real lives to other people's, you know, highlight reels. And that's like their Instagram feed. That's not really what's going on. You look at a picture of my Instagram feed of our smiling children and the five of us, you know, with a nice background. Like, I mean, we were fighting right before that. The kids were crying. You know, it's, it's just, 
it's just kind of nonsense. So my advice to this person is one, like pick a couple of people you trust and go first, tell them, you know, this just happened and I need help. Right. And I need help either on dealing with it emotionally or I need help on finding something new. And I think you'll be shocked at the way that people respond to that because most people I think are sort of looking for an opening to be real with somebody. And I believe very strongly in this old adage of like the best way to learn if you can trust somebody is to trust them, right? Is to try it, see, see what happens. And so I think that um, if you reach out to a couple of people and try to help them help you solve their problem, I think help solve your problem, I think you'll find two things. One, I think they'll help you. And two, the second thing is I think you'll help them. And I bet you, if I was the guest, that if you told three or four people, you will be shocked at what you hear back from them in terms of things that are going on in their lives. And I would not be surprised if you have sort of a tearful thing together of, oh my gosh, I've been waiting to talk to somebody about my thing. I'm actually having trouble too, right? And I think that that, that to me is the biggest thing that I would suggest. And I think I can tell you I've had that. Um, and I try to go to you know that select group of people when that happens and just try to be real on what the heck's going on. What about the role of reciprocity and friendship? Because I never want to like lay a big sob story about how crummy I'm feeling on a friend. I'll do that, but then I feel like I need to listen for them or, and I don't want to like dump yeah. too much of it on them. So how do you know, I mean, how do you make those judgments about how much sharing is too much sharing? Yeah, I think Shane, I like what Shane said, which is part of the reason I think we get along so well is I think we have a similar time orientation, which is you just got to believe that in the long term, it'll even out, right? You think about the decision Shane talked about when he was on the basketball court. It's not that every time it's going to be right, but over a long term, it'll work, right? And I think that if you believe that you have a real relationship with somebody and you go first, then, you know, over the course of a year, two years, five years, I think that it'll even out, you know, um, and I think, again, it's worth, it's just a lot better when you're real. I think people crave that authentic human connection. And I really genuinely believe that like, look, all of us are going to have professional things that go poorly. All of us are going to have personal things that go poorly. I saw a stat one time that I don't remember what this number was, but I think it was something like some number of years ago, nobody ever talked about miscarriages, right? And then there was a stat that came out that I think it was like 20% or something of all pregnancies end in miscarriage around the world. I mean, it's a startling number, but it's this very difficult thing that people deal with that for a long time, nobody talked about. And then I think over time when people started talking about it, I think it was a lot more helpful for people if you read it in that they're like, well, other people have been through this too, right? And it's not something that we have to go through alone. So anyway, the one thing I would say is don't add loneliness to a very difficult situation that you already have you know, and try to, try to solve that part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you both about um, gender and friendship? I think you know, I realized thinking about this, most of my friends are women, and that has a lot really to do with my professional life because anthropology is a predominantly female profession. So that's who I hang out with. And, and I actually feel kind of awkward hanging out with men sometimes. But like if you're in the sports world, and I would say, I mean, Silicon Valley, correct me if I'm wrong, that in investing is still predominantly male world. And you're tending to probably to make more friends, you know, more chances to make friends with men. I feel like, I mean, I don't really know if it matters or if I kind of get something different out of being friends with women than I do with, with men. Uh, somehow I feel it's like easier for me with women that men, Shane talked about this a little bit, that we're still kind of like guys and like we should be talking about sports and beer drinking and we're sort of like there's sort of these expectations about what a you know a guy's friendship should be that I don't really feel with women but could you talk about that I mean I'm sure both of you have you know close female friends as well and it, you something it, it, or is it just it, they're all cool a, people they can make friends with and it doesn't really it's matter a running, it's a running joke every year at our fantasy football boondoggle that we go to, um, I come home and my wife Heidi says, well, did you, did, did, did you ask, um, you know, our, our one friend about his, his relationship? And I said, no, not women at, at, at these things. About football and beer and farts, I don't know, like, um, and so, you know, I, I, I highly value, I'm, I'm super lucky. Um, to have a, an amazing wife. We met in seventh grade, so the person I've known the longest in the world, um, with an amazing group of friends. And um, 
like I said before, for me, I, I try to leave the, the office at the office when I played. And so it was easier for me to, to sort of be vulnerable to, to women um, than it was to, to, to men. I mean, that's something I've, I've really had to work on and, and be proactive about. Um, but, you know, I think the fulfillment that I get from my, 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 my female friends is, is different, but it's, it's, it's still awesome. And it, it you know, I will, I will say that my female friends, uh, they hold me to maybe a higher standard than my, my male friends do, uh, which is good. I need it sometimes. I can be an idiot. Um, and, you know, I, I never thought about it in gender terms like that. Uh, but just thinking about it now, um, the diversity of my friends in, in, ge in gender terms uh, make, me, make me whole. Robbie? Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's super thoughtful. I mean, I, I agree with Shane. I, you, I do get something different out of, you know, each friendship. And I think that, I think the segmentation along gender lines is actually still a pretty good one in terms of like, it is different. Um, most of my female friends, uh, I find that have come from either work or have come from, um, like, you know, friends that of, of, of these, I think it's less likely that I will make a female friend in the way that I met Shane, uh, you know, at a wedding where we're chatting. Um, that just seems kind of like a weird way for me to meet somebody, uh, who's not a guy probably. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I do get something out of it. I also get... I'm, I'm like, I mean, this is funny because I'm like a 39 year old man. I'm very close to my mom, you know? And so I, my mom is a very good friend of mine. And then, um, you know, I, um, I'm very close to my sister-in-law. And so I think that those are also people that end up being just like friends of mine where you do get something dramatically different. Uh, and then of course my best friend is of me, right? You know, uh, my wife, I, I, Shane is the only one who beats me. Like I, I mean, I met her freshman year, my sophomore year. And so generally speaking, we're like the, you know, uh, king and queen of the long, long relationship. But, you know, we we really fall behind the baddies. Uh, one of our viewers, I think you'd both want to know this, Shane and Robbie says, um, you guys are making me cry in my duvet. We've <laughs> <laughs> love love really been talking about duvet covers a lot, you know, as you as you can tell. Um, somebody else asked, and this is a, a simple, straightforward, and good question. How do you, both of you are I, I have been doing numbers driven work and uh, analytical work, but so where is gut instinct figure there? Like how do you, you know, sometimes the numbers don't square up about a player or about an investment that you're gonna make, but there's some part of you that thinks, you know, this, this is gonna work. How do, you, how, do you, how do you sort out the numbers from the gut instinct? Robbie, take that one. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I love that question. I love that question. I, um, I find, uh, I'll give you two questions I try to ask myself, um, but in the context of a story. So when I was working, uh, I used to work at a private equity firm, you know, I was there for 10 years, you know, good job. I liked it. I'm like, again, from like an immigrant family where like that, the fact that it was like stable and good was like a pretty good, you know, situation. And when I left to go work at um, Instacart, it was a very small company and it was sort of felt like rationally, I don't know how much sense it made. And I was, all the analytics around it probably said not to go. But the thing that was, was really helpful was my wife being like, do you think you'll regret not going? And you know what? Like that was really helpful. That was like a really helpful question of just like, you know, your gut tells you, I was like, yeah, I do think I'll regret not going. And I think about this quote a lot. A friend of mine one time said, he's like, there comes a point where you're not auditioning for your life anymore. You're living it, right? Um, and so I try to think a lot about the, you know, regret minimization function is what uh, Bezos talks about. So he talks about it even with an equation. But then I just try to think about it as like, you know, um, is this something you want to be involved in for a long time? A lot of time in investing, the numbers, honestly, they, they tell you, some of the story, but not enough. And so for me, two things that I write down in my notebook every time I meet a new company is, you know, would you want to be on the board of this company for the next 10 years? And would you tell your best friend that they should go work there? And if the answer to that is no, then maybe you shouldn't do it, right? Um, and so anyway, I think about those kinds of things a lot. So I try to get it to 
some basic question I can ask myself to measure the good instinct. Um, but it plays a huge role, huge role in my life. You know, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic than I am an optimist on, on most things. Uh, when I hear a new idea, when I meet a new person, I think, hmm, what's wrong with this? Um, and I'm, I don't know if I'm proud of that, but that's just the way that I'm, that I'm wired. Uh, so when I have a gut instinct of immediately yes, that's when I'm more worried than when I, when I have a gut instinct of no. You know, the, 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 sort of the, the, the normal, is, the answer is no. Why couldn't it be yes? And then I go into my, my database decision making and thinking about it and, and gathering as much information as, as I can. Uh, but when I see something that, uh, that I immediately, you know, passes all the, the receptors and it says, yes, this is it. Um, that's when I st slow down and question and, and that's when I know I have to do even more work. <laughs> it's not like me to say yes. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about betrayal, because the the um, the other side of the coin of friendship is betrayal. How about this? Is paraphrasing a question that somebody's asked, but how do you deal with? And we don't need to name any names or you know reveal any secrets. But um, how do you deal with the issue of trust? And you know, friendships can go bad. And um, how do, how do you you just deal with that when it happens or? Or, um, and I guess I'd ask you both, I, I happen to be somebody who holds grudges. Do you hold grudges toward like people that you felt have, have, have uh, let you down? No, I, I, I don't you think know, it's again, a productive feeling. No, it's not a, not a productive uh, emotion. And, you know, like I said, I, I had a very different upbringing um, as a mixed kid. When, when my mom, who's white, uh, had me back in 1978, um, her mother, she's adopted, uh, refused to acknowledge me as her grandson because I was half black. So as a result, I didn't have really any relationship with my mother's extended family on, on her side. And I, I know that my, my father's side wasn't thrilled that he had married, you know, came from a, fam a large family in Mississippi, wasn't thrilled that he had married a white woman. All right, so I didn't feel a lot of love from uh, my extended family. Okay, and so uh, from an early age, probably my earliest memory, um, I, I guess I thought that sort of frail, looking back at it, nah, it's, just, it's just part of life and, and you deal with it and you deal with it. And it wasn't something like, I know, I know it sounds bad, but I didn't, I didn't take it personal. <laughs> I didn't take it personal that my, that my grandmother didn't want to acknowledge me as, as her grandson. I just thought it is what it is. Um, and so I guess when you're, you know, when, when your family um, does it to you at, at an early age, anything that a friend does to you, uh, much less, you know, harm your wife or your children growing, growing up is, or going, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you can live with it. Mm -hmm. And you get to a point where you say, look, I, I'm, I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm vulnerable. I put myself out there. And um, it didn't work out this time. That, it is what it is. And there's no reason to... To, to harbor a, a stone heart and you have to continue to love and you have to continue to, continue to be vulnerable, um, knowing that your heart's gonna get broken again. And that's just part of the game of life. And that's okay, that's how you grow and you learn. Um, and so I, I like to think I'm not a vengeful person or, or a hateful person. Um, if I'm not that person's cup of tea, then try, try some coffee, I'll, I'll be okay. Now I'm crying in my debate. You know, nice. <laughs> I'll tell you, and I know you guys we talked about this earlier, that we would be really straightforward. Like, I really admire that about Shane. I, I don't know that I have the same, you know, uh, um, uh, elevation. I don't, I don't know that I've achieved that because, and maybe it is because like, I grew up, it was sort of, um, I, I didn't feel that betrayal at all growing up from, you know, family uh, growing up. And so maybe I have this like expectation that I won't be. And so I don't know, but I, I do know this. I, I certainly will try to be vulnerable with people, but I am probably one level less forgiving than Shane is, or five levels less forgiving than Shane is um, on that until the person, until we can work it out. I am somebody who like tries to go talk about it, but I probably aren't honestly, sadly, a little bit more in the camp of what you said of like, 
there are a few people who I probably don't have a lot of time for and haven't quite uh, been able to forget about, right? Um, overall, I still don't think it's given me a stone heart. I love meeting new people. I love being vulnerable with people. I love building up that relationship. But if it goes wrong and we don't sort of sort it out, then like I probably keep it for too long and it's not something I'm terribly proud of. Yep, yep. Uh, okay, you're, you're being asked for some advice here. Are there specific steps you might recommend that can move you from that initial spark and interest in a potential friendship to a deeper, truly, truly meaningful friendship? So how do you, uh, like what, what, you know, you don't want to look over aggressive or, you know, like thirsty you know? or, you know, whatever. Um, so it's, it's hard, and you know that that's a great question because in this question. world of, of Instagram and we're all on on the devices all the time, you know, trying to be authentic through electronic devices and cultivate something you want to cultivate, it's hard. I, mean, I don't I don't think there's a playbook in this electronic digital age, you know, and, and it, it really boils down to I think just old school values of hey, let's go grab a coffee. What's going on? What's up? And you know, it may take people by surprise. Like, what? What do you want? You, you, you want a coffee? What else do you, What else do you want? But um, the old school advice of hey, let's, let's grab a coffee. Let's grab a let's grab a meal. Let's chop it up. Um, I think is as good as, as anything, especially in this digital world. Mm -hmm. This is one thing I also think. I actually have a specific piece of advice on this one, which. It doesn't work terribly well during COVID, but in general, I think it works. I should think your home is a really big, like, you know, um, difference in friendship. And I think that like spending time with somebody at their house, at their apartment, at their, where they live, I think actually is pretty different than like going somewhere else. So I think that, you know, one of the things early on that Shane did was he was visiting California and like, we had been texting and I was like, dude, just come over and watch, you know, we're gonna watch the tournament. That day and Shane came over for the day and we just like you know watched basketball we were with my kids we were with my uh, with Avni my parents were in town all of a sudden you really like kind of get to know somebody right um and then there's this little anecdote that I'm sure I don't even know if Shane remembers but it it teaches you a lot about somebody you know since my parents were in town we left them with the kids and me and Shane and uh, Avni went out to lunch at some like Mexican restaurant and um I had gone to the restroom and then I came back and, you know, I was going to sit on one of the, I was going to sit down and Shane had noticed, I guess my seat had something on it or whatever. And so Shane is down, you know, he's, he's got a napkin. He wipes it off my seat before I go sit down. I told him, I said, the only person I've ever seen that's wiped my seat before I sit down is my mom. Right. But you see that. And like, that's somebody who cares about you. That's somebody with values. That's somebody who's, you know, that's really different. And the way that it happened was, was like, why don't you come to my house? We'll spend time. And then there was some organic thing that ends up happening. But I guess on to your question or to the question that we got, I think that if you can get something with somebody where you're spending time in a place that they care about, I actually think it affects you. I think it affects the way you think about things and affects your level of comfort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's move for a minute to the, this is a question, again, paraphrasing a question, but from the, from the personal, from friendship to the political. And so, you know, we all know that BLM is has that, like Black Lives Movement is a really powerful kind of platform and impact in a, in a you know, in a, in a remarkable kind of way in the bubble and that you have um, predominantly African-American athletes speaking out about politics in a way that has its antecedents in Muhammad Ali and John Carlos and Tommy Smith, but is also kind of different. And I wondered if you, if, if this, maybe this is something you, you do or don't talk about, but kind of like how you see the kind of like political climate in the basketball world right now as against kind of Silicon Valley and, and the investing world. Um, how do you, I mean, they're, they're two very different kinds of situations. Their basketball is this kind of nationally televised spectacle you know, Silicon Valley and, and venture capital is, is not televised. It's not a platform the same kind of way, but they're both worlds that exercise tremendous influence on American opinion and American culture. So can you just talk a little bit about, uh, and I'm not asking to hear about, you know, who you're going to vote for or whatever, but just the role of politics in your um, professional lives and how that might or might not intersect right now. 
we live in a super interesting time in, in professional sports, obviously. And it's a much different climate than when I played. Okay. No one talked about economics or the investments they were involved with or their wins or their losses in the locker room. It was a taboo subject. Um, you see the, the Steph Curry's and the Clay Thompson's and Draymond Green's and, um, you know, Andre Iguodala's. Today's LeBron James, you, you see a much more educated um, athlete, especially fiscally. And that's important because before, when there were social causes that were brought to the forefront by athletes, it was... It just lived in, in the social circle, civil rights. Now, the athletes know that the way to truly create equity and create equality is to get involved in the financial game, is to get involved with Silicon Valley. And so that's been, um, I, I think, a great development um, because I do think that the financial services industry is the greatest engine of wealth in our country. And uh, you know, Black people of color have, have been locked out. And so the more we can, you know, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And the more we can shine a light on, on, on that and get involved and get more people of color involved with financial services um, is at the end all be all no, but it's a great, great, great start. Um, and so I, I've been proud of uh, my MBA athletes, my MBA brothers for, for standing up. Uh, for not just talking about civil rights, but talking about uh, financial rights and uh, economic rights and, and, and group economics. And, um, you know, the more we socialize this, this issue, uh, the quicker it'll, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, it's a good question. And I would say that I agree with what Shane said on it, which is that the world is changing. And I think that uh, there's this quote that uh, President Obama would talk about a lot that I think comes from Martin Luther King, which was, you know, the moral arc of justice is long, but it bends towards justice. Or, yeah, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I hope that what we're seeing is sort of a very big zigzag, but something that's moving us closer to where we ought to be, which is more access, you know, for everyone and more economic opportunity for everyone. And so it's interesting. I think the thing that I thought about from one of the Friday conversations we had uh, recently, Shane, was when you move away from sort of the simple politics of something and you think about how something actually affects people, it changes your behavior. Shane talked about how his father ran a minority owned business growing up, right? And the, the steel company. And I think that when you hear about, and Shane should talk about it if he's comfortable, but like the, if you, when you hear about the impact that certain programs have on people that you care about, love and you know, respect, it makes you think a lot more about those things. Right. And so that was very affecting to me. And then the other thing that's been affecting to me that has been the authenticity with which certain founders and founders are really um, the sort of soul of Silicon Valley, the creators. These are the people. It's not the investors. It's the people that actually go and make, you know, the new things. I've been in a couple of meetings with founders where they started with, you know, a social commentary. They started with something about what's going on in the world, what it means to them and that it's important to them in this room of power, in the literal boardroom, that we talk about this stuff. And I think that's incredibly powerful. I love that. I think my big push is, you know, with um, Justice Ginsburg passing away, rest in peace. A lot of the things you read about her are these unlikely friendships that she had with people where they found ways to talk about things where they didn't reduce it to the political simplicity but instead they went to the kind of the, the core of the issue and they found they agreed more than they disagreed. I hope that there's a bunch of this stuff that we can find agreement on independent of political stuff that's just like, just as humans, it sure seems like it would be a lot better if some of these things didn't happen, you know, or happened a lot less. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have friends who have radically different political opinions from you? Because I love that image of Ruth Bader Ginsburg being friends with you know, the most conservative justice, Anton Scalia, and that they could disagree about everything, yet have a drink and go riding on an elephant on a trip to India and stuff. But I actually think that's pretty rare. I think, yeah, you know, in general, we tend in America to kind of segment and be segmented by kind of political opinion, race, class, and we tend to travel in circles of people 
like ourselves, who think like ourselves. But I'm curious about either of you. Do you have, you know, you have people who, like, when you think about their politics, you're just appalled, but, you know, you love something else about them. Not, and let's, I'm not talking about family here, because <laughs> almost inevitably there's going to be some, you know, a little bit of everything. I would say for me, I, that's probably a weakness of mine. You know, I, my, my, first of all, my, my circle is small. My, to, to get in my circle, and you, you, you have to you have to, to bring something to the game. You, you got to have some game. Um, you have to have empathy. You have to have uh, thoughtfulness, sensitivity. Um, Dunleavy doesn't count. Okay, Even, you know, he doesn't. He doesn't. He has none of those things. So Dunleavy doesn't count. Um, we love him because he's a big galoot. Um, and so I, I think that's a, it's an area of of, of growth for me. And I, I've not done a good job of that. You know, that's, a, that's a weakness. Yeah, I think um, for me, I do have it, but not because I'm good at anything, but because of where I've worked. And so as I've worked, when you work in finance, you know, if you have, a, there's just ends up being people who think differently about certain things than you do um, or than I do. And so that has totally happened for me. Um, but probably not as much outside of that as I would like. And I don't think I agree with Shane um, on that for me. I think the interesting thing has been one of the things I try to think about a lot is that, you know, in the last election, one candidate got, both candidates got over 60 million votes. So for me to have a point of view that I can't be friends with somebody um, who has a different opinion than me, of the voting public, that was half of the country. Like that seems like a crazy point of view, right? To, to, for me to have of like, well, you know, I, I can't have a relationship with, with half of the people in the country that, that just seems like I'm being very close-minded. So it's one of those things where um, I do have it. To be fair though, Warren, I think that I don't think I do it nearly to the level of the people I admire who find ways to chat without getting into it on those topics. I think honestly, we end up avoiding it much more. And I wish we didn't, I wish we, found ways to get into it more and understand and, and uh, care. But that's definitely a weakness of mine too. It's more like, oh, cool. We, we agree on lots of other things. Let's just not talk about the things we don't agree on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we do that with our with family members that we love sometimes that we realize there are these spaces that are not going to be good for us to go into because, and out of love and respect for each other, we, we don't go yeah. in those places. Kane had a picture of himself at Thanksgiving a few years ago that he sent out to us, which was uh, no politics talk at Thanksgiving. If you want to talk about the state of something, talk about the state of my mashed potatoes or something like that. <laughs> Let me ask one more political question anyway. It seems, I, I don't imagine a lot of NBA players are going to be voting for President Trump. It's pretty clear what, I'm sure there's more diversity of opinion than maybe we see in the kind of public presentations and stuff, but it's pretty clear kind of like politically and in terms of social justice issues where the NBA is, you know, is at now. What would you say about um, Silicon Valley and um, um, right now, Rob? I mean, there's sometimes you have President Trump saying kind of like, you know, Google and the Zuckerbergs and they're all kind of out to get me and against me. I don't, you know, but then there are people on the left who hate Facebook. And so what I'm imagining it's sort of a kind of, if I had to guess a kind of mix of different perspectives that's maybe a little like a little left of center if you had to add up the different kinds of inclinations but what, what's your take and, and the kind of feelings about you know the election and what it's going to mean for the country yeah look i i think silicon valley as a whole is probably a little bit more left of that uh there's of course exceptions um and there's vocal exceptions but i think Silicon Valley runs the risk a little bit of being an echo chamber if you don't really try to reach and listen to people with different points of view. Um, there was this fascinating commentary from Facebook, independent of your political leanings that uh, happened the other day, which was effectively Facebook's workforce is pretty left, but Facebook's user base actually tends to be more you know, right. And so it's this very interesting thing, which is like, well, what does that mean for the product that they build? What does that mean for all of that? And I think that, I guess what I'd say to answer your question is, I think that the way that Silicon Valley will succeed is you have to pay attention to your own biases 
and you have to listen to your users and understand what they want and their biases, right? When I worked at Instacart, you know, 85% of our customers were women. Well, you know, if the founder of Instacart is a, is a guy and, you know, uh, some of us on the leadership team, we had a, a, a mixed gender leadership team, but it wasn't 85% women. Well, that means you have a big obligation to go and listen. And I think it's similar on this topic, which is I think you can surround yourself. Most people think research is finding people that agree with you and then quoting them. I think you know better than anyone. That's not really what it is. It's going and learning the actual story. So I think Silicon Valley definitely could invest more in hearing different perspectives on any number of topics because we're supposed to be helping usher in a new future. That's a very bold statement, but we're supposed to be helping doing that. Mm -hmm. We're getting sort of near the end of our time and I want to ask a, like a fanboy question of each one of you. And Ravi, I'd like, you know, Instacart is kind of legendary and you, you left before the pandemic, right? Yeah, uh, I left in November of last year. Last year. So um, could you just tell us a little bit of the story of, I'm sure you've told this a million times, of kind of like the creation of Instacart, what that was like? And, um, you know, I mean, how did it feel, among other things, to kind of leave? And then I assume, I haven't, I don't know the figures, but I assume that like business is just blown up in the, um, I mean, in the good way, with yeah. some issues about whether workers are getting paid fairly and sure. also, but could you just talk about Instacart a little bit? Yeah, totally. I am. Um... And, and if you want to add anything about something that like totally energizes you about the work that you're doing now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Instacart, I'll, I'll go somewhat quickly. Instacart was started in 2012. And, um, you know, the simple idea behind it was sort of like, you can get anything delivered, but you still shop for groceries the same way you did 80 years ago. And that just seems strange. And I think the vision that the founder, who's a really, you know, great guy, good friend of mine, a uh, close friend of mine named Corva Mehta had was, why would you shop for groceries the same way as you did 80 years ago? You should get tons of time back. And also the grocery stores sort of adjust to who you are, right? If you're a vegetarian, if you're on a certain diet, if, you know, um, it should be different. Why would the store be the same for me and for you and for Shane or for somebody else? And uh, to give really people back their time. And so it, it has been a fascinating journey in that that has not always been a popular idea. I think it's easy to look at it now and be like, well, it's very clearly successful. It, it was not always very popular there. We were a company that a lot of, were very polarizing. And a lot of people thought that it made no sense. This economics was not gonna make sense and all of that. And so I, I share that, you know, in that I have a poem on my desk. You can see it behind me, this, this thing behind me. It's If by Rudyard Kipling. And um, the first line is, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And that's what it feels like sometimes to be, you know, a leader of something that's volatile. And we had a, a passionate customer base with a passionate, you know, uh, employee base with a passionate shopper base. And it can feel like everyone is sort of, you know, coming at you. But it, it was a fascinating thing. And um, I think the big reason that I liked it so much was I love the people. I also feel like it's inevitable. I think that it is a massive People buy a trillion dollars worth of groceries every year in the United States and Canada. And groceries are this enormous category and very little of it's bought online. Even today, I, I, you guys would be shocked. Even today during the pandemic, less than 10% of the total grocery sales that happen in the United States happen online. Today, 60% of electronic sales happen online, right? And so you look at that and you're kind of like, that's gonna be really big over time. Um, and then I, the story I'd share with you as it relates to the pandemic is I think that um, I still talk to my friends at Instacart most days. Um, and I think the thing that the team did an amazing job of was understanding their values, which is, look, we need to be there for our customers. That means do whatever we have to do in order to do that. So Instacart, you know, when I got to Instacart, we had 6,000 shoppers. When I left, we had 250,000 shoppers. Today, we have 700,000 shoppers. That is an insane number of like jobs created that happened. And we have now millions of customers. So I'm really proud of the team and I'm proud that I got to work there. It wasn't always easy, but uh, I'm really happy that I was part of it. What's the biggest myth or misconception that we outsiders have about 
doing a startup and the whole Silicon Valley world thing, whatever? Overnight success. It is that this idea of, you know, people are overnight, you know, this happened. It's nothing is overnight. It's, 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 I am not at all suggesting it is like some of the jobs that people have in this country and the difficulty that comes along with that. So that, that is not what I'm saying. I am saying it's objectively hard to build something from nothing, right? It did not exist and now it does and it serves millions of people. That does not happen without a lot of sweat and tears and time. And I think that um, generally speaking, people think of Silicon Valley as almost like, um, you know, kind of computer magic. Like it's, it's not, it's just like anything else. You gotta go and just perspire. Uh, it's more perspiration than inspiration. That's the thing that I, I would say is the thing that people miss. Shane, the team that you've helped to put together is one game from the NBA finals. Um, what can you tell us about that? Maybe including something maybe we didn't know or things that we should look for in the team going ahead. Um, um, three one is better than being down one three. That's, that's uh, let, let me let me state the obvious. Analytics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> analytics. Analytics. Three three is worth more than two, um, as as we say. Um, you know we we have a really tough group, uh, a group that got better over the course of a year. Uh, we're, we're a little bit of a non-traditional team. We, we have, you know, two great all-stars, Bam Amadio and Jimmy Butler. Um, but a lot of young guys that have, have really risen to the challenge. And, uh, you know, a lot of credit to Eric Spolstra, who, who's really created a culture of, uh, of just toughness and, and togetherness. And uh, like, we always used to, like we always say, the Miami Heat are not for everybody uh, because we are very demanding. Uh, we, uh, we work very hard and everyone works hard, but we work especially hard and, uh, there's no time for hurt feelings. So it's not for everybody. Um, uh, but it's, it's great when you see the process of, of scouting and coaching and player development and strength and conditioning and training all come together, uh, to, to produce a, a great team. And that's what we are now. We're just a, a, a team that relies on each other to, to advance and um, it's really exciting to be a part of. So, uh, you know, game four is always, it's always the hardest one to, to, to take home. All right, so you never take it for granted. You have to go earn it. Uh, we're playing against the Boston team. That's it's really, really good, really talented, super well coached. Um, but we make some shots, we'll take our chances. Great. Could you say one word about, since you've um, been exposed to a lot of great coaches, what is it that, I don't want to ask like what makes a great coach, but like an Eric Spolstra, he's clearly, you know, he's won championships with LeBron James and now he's got a team competing at the highest level that, you know, many people didn't think had the, you know, super elite level talent. Maybe you knew better through analytics that the talent was there, but what, it, what, I don't know. Like, I don't have a good, like, what, let, well, let's just add, let me just ask about Eric Spolstra. What is it particularly about him that makes it work? Well, I've, I've been blessed uh, to play for numerous Hall of Fame coaches. You know, from my high school coach, Coach Keener, to Coach K, uh, you know, to Hubie Brown, to uh, Rick Adelman, to, to Eric Spolstra. I mean, Hall, Hall of Famers up and on the line. And what I would say makes a great coach um, at the highest level is, A, it's, it's competency. All right. Players are really good. The players may not have the answer, but they know what the answer is not. And so if they get bad information and they look bad, the coach has no chance. So you have to have competency. Um, but secondly, there's, there's, a, there's a humility about this is our team. This is not what this is not just a projection of what I think basketball should be and how it should be played. And I, th I think that's where Spo is really, really good. Uh, with our group, um, we had a tough group to coach. I mean, you talk about LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, Ray Allen, you know, mul we, we had like multiple all-stars, Hall of Fame players, you know, guys who thought they knew something. Um, and to balance the egos and, and be humble enough to, to, to take input and just corral a lot of big egos, very, very difficult to do. But Spo did a great job. 
Um, now he has the credibility a little bit more, so it's, it's a different scenario, but Spo still um, maintains a grinder's for mindset and um, a humility about uh, being fortunate to be there, making the most of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's been a great leader for our, our, for our franchise, and we're lucky to have him. Great. We're at the end of our time, and I'd like to let uh, people who are watching know that next week uh, at uh, the conversation will be at noon on October 1st, and we'll have Kathleen Corbero, who's an um, uh, important former UN official, and Michael Merson, who's the founding director of the Duke Global Health Institute um, here. So everybody is very welcome to join us for that. And it's been an absolute delight to uh, share an hour in the middle of the pandemic with, um, with Robbie and Shane, and thanks to all of you for your um, for your great and sometimes vulnerable questions as well. Bye-bye. Thank you.